thank you everyone for being here today. Thank you, Catherine, for coming to an object workshop. I'm so excited to have you. You were the first author to ever sign my book. And so this is just like <laughs> reminding me of how old I'm getting really quickly. Um, so the workshop today will have three parts. There'll be a time where we can chat with Catherine. And then girls, if you have any questions, you're welcome to save them until the end. And there'll be time for you to ask her questions. And then we'll be doing a writing activity where we'll learn a bit more about Catherine's writing process. And then there'll be time for food, which is my favorite part. And that's also a time to get your book signed if you brought one. So would you like to just start by maybe introducing yourself? I would indeed. But first, I have to thank this amazing young lady you. and her brother <laughs> for, uh, for making this happen. Because um, I just I love the idea of being t able to talk um, to girls. And I know there's some guys here, too, which is wonderful, about writing. Because um, I think you get a lot of weird stuff sometimes from the culture and from school. And I want to tell you what it's really like. So we're going to do, uh, you can ask anything. And I will absolutely try to answer it. As long as you remember one thing, I'm just one writer. And we're all different. And so there is no one answer. Um, but hopefully you'll walk out of this at the end and you'll feel more confident about being a writer and being a reader and realize just how much fun it is because, guys, it's really fun. My job is this. I wear pajamas to work and I make stuff up and people pay me. <laughs> Tell me that is not like the best job on the planet. It is so cool. So um, I hope that I am seeing lots of fellow writers in the audience already. So maybe you could just start by telling us a little bit about where you grew up and how you got into writing. Well, I was born in Michigan. I've lived all over. Um, my dad was with IBM. He was a systems engineer. And so we moved around a lot. And the joke was that IBM stood for I've been moved. And so I lived in, I've lived, you name it, I've probably lived there. But um, I. And I will be confessing this to you in more detail in my, uh, my little presentation. But the thing I always tell kids when I do school visits, and typically I have the parents and teachers cover their ears, and I get about 50% compliance because, you know, parents. Um, but my secret is that I really, really, really didn't like to read when I was your age. And I know I'm not supposed to say that. And I say that at schools, and the teachers are all like, Oh, that's the last thing we need, lady. <laughs> but, but it's the truth. I thought it was boring. I have a daughter who has dyslexia. And for her, reading was really challenging for different reasons. Um, and you can, be, you can overcome dyslexia with really good, you know, lots of work and good teachers. That wasn't my problem. My problem was I just thought it was really boring. <laughs> and so <laughs> it took me forever. I finally found the perfect book. And it was Charlotte's Web. I am fully convinced that Charlotte's Web was written for me, not for anyone else. I believe Kate DeCamillo thinks it was written for her, but she's wrong. It is, for me, the perfect book, because I happen to love animals and because there's so much wisdom in those pages that you can go back and read it as an adult. And it's still an amazing book. But you know what? After that, I didn't read very much. I wrote a little. And it took me a long time. I got a degree in English from the University of Texas. I happened to be living in Texas at the time. Um, and I promptly went out and became the world's worst waitress. I will show you a picture of myself as the world's worst waitress soon. Um, and I was terrified of writing. It seemed like such a public way to fail. And that's one of the things I told you, that I don't really like doing workshops. Because to me, you guys, I, I don't want any of you to feel like you have to share a word of anything you write today. You don't even have to talk about it. You don't even have to do it. You can just doodle, as far as I'm concerned. Because I don't like the pressure of being in a big group with a certain time and then thinking I have to share something. That, to me, is like the, the worst. Um, the worst way to, for me to approach writing. My husband is total opposite. He also writes books. He writes um, really scary books for young adults. His name is Michael Grant. He wrote the Gone series and some other stuff like that. And um, he writes 
thousands of words a day. It drives me nuts. And he loves to talk about it. And he's happy to share early on in the process. And I'm like, it's like a little bubble. And I don't want it to burst. And I can't tell anyone. So we're going to do a little bit of that. But you guys are totally free to just mellow out and listen in. And what's your day to day life like as an author? <laughs> Oh, it's very glamorous. I told you about the pajamas. Um, there's a lot of lying around, pretending you're writing, and you're not really writing. You're um, secretly watching TV or playing with a cat. Or suddenly, there's a whole bunch of dust bunnies under the bed you have to deal with. Procrastination is half of writing as any writer will tell you. And I am, I am like a consummate procrastinator. I'm really good at not. Even in high school and middle school, I remember I was always like the night before, that's when I did my homework. Um, yeah, oh, good. See? It's, it's OK as long as you get it done. You know, um, Some people need that pressure. Right now, I'm um, behind on a rewrite for a second book in a trilogy. That's usually how it is. And my editors kind of roll their eyes, um, although I try really hard. To, to get stuff done. Um, it's hard for me. So I get up. I like to write in the morning. You guys will find, every single one of you, there's a special time of day that's like the perfect time for you to be writing. Um, when you're awake and your brain isn't filled with a whole bunch of other stuff. And um, for some people, I know a lot of writers who write late at night and a lot who write you know, first thing in the morning. I'm morning because then life gets complicated and I have kids and, and you know conferences and lots of stuff going on. Um, and I know Kate DiCamillo um, is sort of the opposite of me, but I think this is a really good strategy. She writes, I want to say it's two pages a day, but she writes like Monday through Friday, same time every day, two pages a day. And I do know writers like that. Uh, Linda Sue Park is another one. If you go online. Um, she wrote, uh, most recently, uh, one of her books was um, Long Walk to Waters. Maybe some of you have read that recently. She's a Newbery author. And she's on Twitter. And she will tell you almost every single day how many pages she wrote or how many words. A lot of times, it's how many words she deleted or how lousy the day went. And it's really reassuring to other writers to see that, oh, yeah, you're going to have a lot of bad days when you write. Um, you're going to skip days. You're, you're not always going to be able to do it. But writing turns out to be kind of a muscle you have to use. So in the same way, if you want to play soccer and be good at it, you got to do it regularly. The more you write every day, the easier it gets. Because you just kind of you get past all the nonsense in your head, and you just go straight to writing. So, so I try to work a couple hours. Um, and then the rest of the day, it's things like editing and um, Skyping and all the other stuff that goes into being a writer. But those, like most writers I know, have about two or three really good hours where it's just creativity. And then your brain gets kind of tired. Mm -hmm. And you've written a lot of books, but obviously all of them haven't been super successful. So what's it like for you to just get back up every day and just continue writing? You may have noticed the title of my talk. Um, writing is about failing. It's about failing spectacularly. One of the hardest things, I think for you guys, I think about this a lot, because um, you're at a really exciting, precious time in your life, blah, 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 blah. But it's also really hard. I, I, if you ask most of the moms and dads in this room if they would want to go back to your age and relive it, I bet a lot of them would go, nah, thanks. Been there, done that. Because it's hard. Because you have so much pressure on you. you have friends who are telling you how you should look, and you have teachers telling you to redo your homework, and you have a million people telling you you have to work really, really hard, or you're not going to get into Harvard. And you've got just the daily grind of turning on TV and seeing that you should look a certain way and dress a certain way and have a certain amount of money. Oh my gosh, it's exhausting. I was really miserable in mid middle school, to tell you the truth. Um, I was bullied a little bit. I was weird. Um, and as I will be discussing with you, if you want to be a writer, being weird is extremely useful. I don't know a single writer who isn't weird. I might be the best author out there. <laughs> well, that's good. because, And by that, I mean um, 
Every author I know has, you know, would say, well, yeah, there were parts of school that were really tough for me where I didn't fit in. And every writer I know would say, um, that gave me the perspective I needed because it helps you look at the world differently. Your pain, your bad days at school, that's stuff you can use to make yourself a better writer because you're looking at the world differently. And that's such a gift, even though it doesn't always seem like a gift. And what role has confidence played in your success, just always kind of fighting through everything? Oh, it has gotten easier, but it took a long time. And every single time, I'm starting a book right now, and I'm looking at the blank page going, oh, man, I have no idea. What, do I, what am I doing? I don't know how to write a book. And I've written 150 books. So when you feel that, it's perfectly normal, because that's part of the writing process. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, because I think that's the hardest part of writing. I really do. And what advice would you have for girls like us who want to grow up and become authors? Oh, well, first of all, I want to tell you something. I run into kids all the time who come up to me. And they have heard about some 18-year-old author who sold a book on her first try for a million dollars and has a movie deal. And they want to be that person. And I want to tell you, I am empowering you right now to hate that girl because <laughs> she is unusual. You're supposed to suffer first. No, you're supposed to. It, writing takes a long time. And sometimes those magical moments where you get published happen right away. But I want you, very importantly, to separate the fun and love of putting words on, on the page from getting published. Because getting published is wonderful. It's really cool. I get to talk to you because I've been published. But if I didn't want to put words on the page every day, I wouldn't be a writer. So I always tell people, this is how you know if you're going to be a writer. Tell yourself you can't write anymore. Just stop. Just stop cold and never put another word on a page. And if you can't do that, you're going to be a writer. It means that writing is important to you. And it should because it's a way to figure out the world. I use writing. For me, the world is messy and complicated. I think it is for most people. And I use writing to make sense of it. You know, to go, I, I just don't get why this is happening right now. Maybe I'll write a story. I used to keep a journal, even though I wasn't much of a writer when I was young. Diaries and journals, they are such a great way to make sense of your crazy lives right now. Write down what you're feeling. Write down what's happening. You don't have to share it with anybody, but it can really help you make your story make sense. And every single one of you is a story. Have you ever thought about that? You have a beginning, and now you're in the early middle, and you are telling your story every day. And we tell ourselves stories. And sometimes those are really lousy stories. We say, I, I can't do this. I'm a failure. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not good enough. Those are bad stories, and you need to rewrite those. Sometimes you get them from other people or from the culture. Sometimes you, they come from inside. But you're writing your own story every day. And putting that down in paper on a journal or a diary is such a great way to, to get a sense of the world. And then, if you want to be a writer, read. Read, 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 read. It is the most important thing, because that is your real teacher. You can get an MFA in writing if you want. You can, um, you can study. You can do workshops. You can do all kinds of things. But at the end of the day, it's just about reading and putting words on paper. It's a very cheap avocation or vocation. It, there's not a lot of training involved. You just need a pencil. I love that. Um, could you writing process and maybe walk us through the slides? Absolutely. Um, you want me to, shall I, shall I head on over? OK, so I'm going to show you some stuff. And um, writing process would be grossly overstating what we're talking about here. Writing mess is more like it. <laughs> um, first of all, and we touched on this a little bit, rule number one, there are no rules. I'm not kidding. There, one of the first things I learned, um, everybody will tell you when you're writing, probably your teachers will too, um, write really fast on your first drafts and let it all come out from deep inside you and your inner writer will come out. And then later on, you know, edit. And that's really, really good advice for 90% of writers. That's not how I do it. I 
have to have my first line right, and I have to have my first chapter right, or I can't go forward. It's really inefficient, and I don't recommend it. But I was at a big old conference. It's called the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. And um, jot that down if you're interested in becoming a children's writer. Um, it's really for adults, but I do know teens and, and middle schoolers who have gone with their moms or dads. And it's a really great way to learn how to be a children's writer. So I was there, and there was this very famous writer named Karen Cushman who won a Newbery book called, who wrote a Newbery, won a Newbery for a book called, uh, Catherine called Birdie, a historical novel. And um, she got up there and she said, I am so embarrassed to tell you this, but I can't get going until my first chapter is perfect. And I went, oh, it's OK. I'm not alone. And that was the moment I realized there are no rules. So yes, your teachers are going to tell you lots of important stuff and listen hard, because most of it is going to be really important. But in terms of your own writing, do it however you need to do it. And it, it may be not like everybody else. Just like every story, every writer's story is different. So we all come at this differently. But just like every story, there are some commonalities. And the one I've heard from every writer on earth is getting over fear of failure and obstacles like that. Remember I told you you need to be weird? That's me at, I think it was age three. I was a very fancy dresser. Writers tend to be weird, and that's a good thing, because we look at the world a little bit differently. Um, one of my weirdnesses as a writer is that I didn't like to read. I did this panel recently, and it was all these famous writers. That Kate DeCamillo was there and some other Newbery winners. Every single one of them said, when I was a kid, reading saved my life. I crawl under my... Uh, my blankets with a flashlight. I read till 2 in the morning. It made my parents so mad. And I was the one who went, mm, I kind of wouldn't like that. You know, one of these things is not like the others. Um, I was a late bloomer. But I did get there. Charlotte's Web helped, and lots of things helped. But everybody has their own path to getting to becoming a writer. That's me as a waitress, fresh off my English degree. I highly recommend English philosophy, history, all those things where they tell you you're never going to get a job, those are wonderful preparation for being a writer. Because you're writing about people and events and life. And a business degree is wonderful, but it, it, may, not, it may not keep you thinking about those other important things. So you don't have to go that path, but, it, but a lot of writers I know did. Um, my husband actually um, uh, quit school in high school. Uh, this is not a path I recommend, but for him, and then he went back to college much later. For him, school just wasn't helping him become the person he needed to be. And then um, he went back much later and he studied philosophy. So everybody's different. This is my turning point. I was a waitress, as you saw. I had four strawberry margaritas on a tray. I walked up to a man dressed exactly like that, except all white, white hat, white shoes, white socks, and I, John, like John Travolta, Saturday night. And um, I spilled all four of those drinks on the man. He was entirely pink. It was so embarrassing. And I had been avoiding writing up until that point because I thought, I cannot fail publicly. And I'm going to, and it's going to be too embarrassing. I cannot do that. So I became a bad waitress, bad plant waterer, bad typist. And it was the moment I dropped those drinks on that man that I thought, you know what? Maybe I should just be a bad writer if I'm going to fail anyway. So there I am, <laughs> having decided not to be a bad writer, cleaning toilets. I decided to get a part-time job. One of the things lots of people will tell you if you want to be a writer is to have another job. Um, this isn't bad advice. Lots of people survive at writing. Most people don't. I have been extraordinarily lucky. And it's like winning the lottery. But I, I would never, ever tell somebody, don't try to be a writer. I would only say, be sure you can pay your bills, too. That's one way I paid my bills. <laughs> now, it doesn't always happen that way, because we talked about the 18-year-old who got the million dollar advance. There are always those people, too. <laughs> so the first thing I did was I worked for free. And I, I volunteered at United Way, and I wrote little teeny paragraphs that were in the local newspaper about um, local charities. 
That's the kind of thing you can do to get your foot in the door when you start. You be, make your writing talents available to the world. Even at this age, you can do that. You'd be amazed how many places uh, online, at school, there are all kinds of ways to contribute your writing. You are not going to get paid usually, but you're going to have fun and you're going to learn. After that, I became one of those annoying people who makes those annoying quizzes. You know those quizzes, they're online a lot now, and it's like, does he really like you, or are you an introvert, or don't take them seriously because I'm the kind of person who was writing them. I was not a psychology major, but it kept, it kept me eating and paying the rent. So I, oh man, I wrote a lot of those. I had no idea what I was talking about. Uh, then, and this is not my book, I thought, okay, I'm going to write under a pseudonym. That means, you know, you're not using your name. And I'm going to write something that would be really, really easy. And I hasten to add, I am a good and proud feminist, but I thought writing a romance would be a really easy way to make some money. I am not showing you my book because I don't want anyone to know the name I was using. <laughs> I wrote two of them. It turns out they're really hard to write. And actually, there are some wonderful writers out there writing romances, but I was definitely not one of them. So I ended up working as a ghostwriter. I wrote, I probably have had a dozen pseudonyms. Those are just a few of them. My favorite is um, R.L. Plum. Um, R.L. Plum is actually um, an anagram for rub a lamp. And I was working for Disney writing um, uh, Aladdin books. And that was the name they came up with. But I started ghostwriting. I wrote tons and tons and tons of Disney. Um, I wrote Sweet Valley. Women of a certain age may remember Sweet Valley. 17 Sweet Valley twins, 17 of them. Jessica was the evil twin. Do you remember them? Um, I wrote little kid books, and I wrote picture books, I wrote horse books, even though the last time I was on a horse I fell off. I wrote romances galore, more romances, I wrote Disney, lots of Disney. I was considered one of the seminal voices for Donald Duck, not auditory, but literary. And um, you would not believe writing for Disney is really funny because they take it very seriously. You better sound like Mickey Mouse. Um, and then my husband and I got together finally, and we were like, this is really tiring, and came up with the idea of writing a series called Animorphs, about kids who could turn into animals. And there were 63 books in that series. We wrote uh, probably two-thirds of them. Book a month. Back in this time, the same time that uh, Goosebumps came out and Babysitter's Club, you may have seen those in your libraries, they came out every single month, which is really fun for kids, because you get a book right away to read. Um, so that was fun because we got to create creepy aliens like yurks who can crawl into your brain and uh, take over. And they, they usually got in through your ear. So that was fun. Then I decided I was going to become a real writer and put my name on a book and write something I cared about. And that was sort of a big transition because it was scary. I wrote Home of the Brave in free verse about a Sudanese refugee. So it was bound to be a bestseller. And um, I loved it. I wrote about something I cared about. And I went, wait a minute. When I write about stuff I'm mad about, something I'm passionate about, suddenly it matters. And I think my writing gets better. So that was about Sudanese refugees. I happened to be living in Minneapolis at the time. And there were all these refugees coming in. I think that's an incredibly brave and amazing thing to do, to start your life over, to learn a new language and a new culture and, and you know, immerse yourself in a new life. And I wanted to write about that. I thought I, I, I had great admiration. Um, I wrote Ivan Next. The one and only Ivan, as some of you may know, um, was based on a gorilla, a true story, a gorilla who ended up in a Tacoma shopping mall and lived there for decades all alone. It was totally bizarre. So I found this story in the New York Times. Highly recommend news as a great way to get ideas. You know when you're thinking you don't know what to write about? Always just ask what if and put a couple things on either side, like cat and table. You say, what if a cat turned into a table? And you have a story. So I don't feel sorry for you. You have plenty of ideas in your head. But news is a great way to get it. And Ivan was, that's Ivan on the left there. 
They were plucked from the Democratic Republic of the Congo and put in a plane. Presumably their um, entire troop was wiped out and um, brought by poachers to Tacoma, where they lived. And um, Ivan was not a happy guy for a very long time. I thought that was an amazing story. And I really wanted to tell it. And I was mad about it. And um, it did really well. And I'm going to tell you in a moment why that's so interesting. But here's where we are now with Ivan. The one and only Ivan has added Helen Mirren to the cast. The 72-year-old actress will work around. And first, we want to read a story about a gorilla. And um, I will talk to you more about that in a moment. But for that to happen, for to, to win a Newbery, that's like getting hit by lightning. That's like that 18 year old who got the, you know, the seven figure advance. Sometimes you're just really lucky. And I do think, I think when you're a writer, talent is important. Um, but more, much more important than talent is learning and tenacity and, and figuring out what you like and reading and reading and reading and writing and writing and writing. But luck is in there too. And I, I won't lie to you, that's true of everything. I mean, it's true of life. And um, sometimes you just get lucky. So, uh, my other favorite is I wish for a pet giraffe. <laughs> so this is my official author photo. Now we're going to get down to work. I show this to kids, and that's all I want you to remember. Only thing I want you to remember it. All that crumpled paper, because that's what writing is about. And when your teacher hands you back your paper, and it's got red marks all over it, welcome to being a professional writer. How many of you have ever told a story or written a story? OK, you're all writers. You don't need to be published to be a writer. Welcome to the club. It's really fun. But as you know, you're going to have a lot of crumpled paper. Now, this is the stuff they teach you in school, so I'm not going to talk about it, but it's all the writing process, pre-writing, brainstorming, research, drafting, revising, proofreading, and maybe or maybe not publishing. Um, you're going to get plenty of that at school. You don't need that from me. You need this from me. I want you to know about crummy first drafts. Now, the, this is actually based on a, there's a book by Anne Lamott, some adults may have read called Bird by Bird. It's a wonderful book about writing and life. And I'm paraphrasing her slightly. But basically, this is the most important thing you need to know about writing. You need to let yourself write badly. These are the don'ts of a crummy first draft. You do not think about capitalization or commas or continuity. You don't think about anything. Some of you may have done this in school. It's, and they probably called it free writing. You know, you're supposed to just let yourself loose. Well, that is a really good, good exercise. At the end of crummy first drafts, through all that coal, you're going to find a couple diamonds. And that's why we do it. And we do it to let ourselves be free. So here's your question. What is the biggest danger when you start a new writing project? Computer crashes, broken pencils, brain farts, or your IE? Does anyone know what an IE is? It's your inner editor. Your inner editor is a butt pain. I don't even know your inner editors, and I don't like them. I can tell you already. When you're doing early drafts, your inner editor has to shut up. And this is the kind of thing your inner editor says to you. This is the worst writing on the planet. You need a comma. Your sister's much better at this. Are you kidding me? Kids, it can turn into animals. I said that a lot during Animorphs. There were 63 books of Animorphs. This is what I wanted to show you. You know, I showed you that clip with Helen Mirren. This is an actual piece of paper that I keep on my desk, and it says, my problem here is, am I giving up on Ivan or not? Halfway through the book, I held it over the trash. I was ready to throw it away. I thought it was the dumbest idea I'd ever had as a writer. I just thought it was crazy. Who's going to want to read about a gorilla from a gorilla's point of view? And I stuck with it. And I'm glad I stuck with it. And that's not to say that all of your stories are going to be winners, are going to be great. Um, most of them won't be. But the point is, following through teaches you all kinds of things about your next story. And you've got to remember that when you're writing. And that your inner editor is the person who's going to keep you from doing that. So let me go back here. I'm going to show you 
before we start this exercise, a little a clip. This is a um, book trailer for uh, Wish Tree. It's made by a little startup company in LA. I love them. It's, it's really a cool job because you hand them a book and they turn it into you know, a minute of visual and it's really very useful. So I want you to watch it. Remember this is a story about a tree. Someone has carved into the tree's bark the word leave, L-E-A-V-E. And the tree happens to be on the property of a young Muslim girl who's just moved to the neighborhood. So that's the premise. And I want you to listen to it. Think about how a tree might think, because then we're going to start our fun. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Make sure this is on. Yeah, do you wanna do that first? Do that. Oh, for sure, let's do that, that'd be fun. Before we get into okay. the activity, we're gonna open it up so girls, if you have any questions, mm. you're welcome to ask now. Oh, come on. You know you wanna ask something. Right here. Um, where do you get your inspiration? Well, I need to pay the rent. That's actually the truth. <laughs> and I'm not being facetious. I mean, it's a job. I, it, it really is. And I think sometimes people forget that. It's, you know, um, I'm sure, how many of you have heard of writer's block? Um, yes. Well, I think writers are very whiny. And we are very melodramatic. And we think, um, th oh, here. You got, you could, here we go. Um, that's a great idea. Um, I think that uh, writers like to think that when we have trouble, it's really, really, really important. And it's not. There's no such thing as mom block or student block or trucker block or nurse block. I don't know why writers get to have writer's block. So um, what happens is you're writing and you have a problem. And um, then you solve it. And it's that simple. But at the end of the day, it is a job. It's, it's very much a job. It just happens to be the only thing I'm good at. <laughs> um, in terms of inspiration, I, it's all around me. And I, 
honestly think I write to make sense of things because the world is so complicated and kind of messy and it helps me. I actually find it therapeutic and I think a lot of you will when you write stories find that it even, you know, even if it's just for yourself. I mean, who else? You're the most important reader of all. If if you write something that helps you get your feelings on paper, that's that's huge. I was really mad. <laughs> I, I mean, I won't deny it. I, I, um, I, I just could not believe. I love this country, and I couldn't believe how we were talking to each other. And by the way, we're still talking to each other. And I wanted to talk about it, but in a way that even a very young reader could understand, but certainly that might appeal to older readers or even adults. And in fact, they're releasing it as an adult book, which I kind of laughed at. But it is, it's sort of a fable. It's a story about how we treat each other. And I just felt like some, I, I, it made me feel better. That's what writing should do. Oh, tricky question. I'm not supposed to answer that. It's like asking your favorite child. Well, my parents would say it's me. <laughs> oh, I'm sure we have an uh, alternate opinion in the audience somewhere. Um, you know, I always answer my favorite book is the one I just finished because I'm so relieved to be done with it. But Rich Tree has a really special place in my heart because it was a way, it was the most obvious way I've ever had to go here's something wrong and I feel helpless, what could I do? And then I wrote something and it made me feel like I'd, I'd done a tiny little piece of something helpful. Um, I hope that's true with Ivan too. Um, a lot, there have been a lot of people who have um, adopted gorillas and, and you know, learned about how, talk. I think we talk more now about how we treat uh, captive wild animals. Um, you may know that Ringling Brothers stopped um, having uh, elephants in their circuses, which was huge. Uh, that happened long before Ivan. But um, I, I think maybe wish tree. <laughs> Is it OK to have an opinion? <laughs> No, I think, <laughs> I'll tell you the truth though, I said that at a, um, a conference, I was talking to writers and I was supposed to be giving them good advice and I said, oh you guys, we're all just being real whiny, come on, there's no trucker's block, just like I said to you. And I don't think they liked hearing that because <laughs> it meant they had to figure out how to solve your problem. So when you um, come up with an idea, would you say, you, um, your idea starts out with the beginning of your story, or would you look at the story as a whole picture? Oh. Whenever I write, I, I find it harder to look at the whole story from the beginning and end. And yeah. That is a fascinating writing question. You could spend hours on that. Um, in writing, in the writing world, there are two ways of thinking. There's pantsers and outliners. And pantsers are fly by the pants people who don't outline and they just sit down and they write. That's my husband, which is why he's annoying. Um, I, a lot of other people are outliners and they're very fastidious and they know. There's um, a famous writer, uh, John Irving, who says he has to know the last line of his book before he can start. And some people write that way. I don't have the hole in my head. I have a vague outline, and then I throw the outline away. And I think a lot of people do that. It's like scaffolding, so you feel a little safe as you ease forward. But what breaks my heart and is so much a part of it is you have to throw stuff away, and you have to be willing to do that. Because you're going to get halfway along and go, I don't like that character. This guy over here is so much more interesting. And characters will take over a book, and you're like, dude, this was not the plan. But you have to do it. Um, so uh, um, have you ever had an imaginary friend like Jackson in Crenshaw? Oh, that's a really good question. No, I think that's why I wrote it. Um, Crenshaw, this kid has this um, giant imaginary cat as a friend. Uh, um, and um, 
oh, Jackson has a giant imaginary friend. Did I say Crenshaw? And, um, and I think it's because I never had one. I had lots of pets, um, especially dogs. I love dogs. And so I think they were kind of like my imaginary friends. But they've done studies, and you would not believe the percentage of people, even up into high school and college, who admit to having imaginary friends is a lot higher than you'd think. I think it's a wonderful thing, because it gives you someone to relate to. You have total control over the friendship. <laughs> Oh, he's written a lot, too. Um, his most famous thing is called Gone, uh, which is about these kids, and they're in high school. And um, I think they're all under the age of 12, though. But it's a high school book. And they're kind of trapped under a dome, and they have to survive on their own. So it's sort of like Lord of the Flies updated. And they're not always nice to each other. And sometimes I read the stuff my husband writes, and I go, how can I be married to you? What is the deal? Where is that coming from? <laughs> oh, I'm glad you asked that. Endling, E-N-D-L-I-N-G, is a new word that's just been coined. And you won't find it in most dictionaries. It means the very last animal in a species or a subspecies. And uh, unfortunately, it's starting to get used more and more and more because we are losing um, species at an unprecedented um, percentage. We're, a lot of people call this the sixth great extinction. And it seems to be entirely man-made, or almost entirely. And um, I thought, what would it be like to be the very last member of a species? I mean, it would. How surreal would that be? So I created a species. Highly recommend this. It's so fun. I made up my own animals. So I love dogs. So I created a talking dog who walks upright. And she can glide, like you know, fly around. And she has opposable thumbs and fingers, so she can hold things. And she's really tough. And how fun is that? I got to sit around and create species all day. I created a, a best friend named Tobble, who's based on a fennec fox. Do you know what they look like? They're so cute. Look one up when you get home. Big eyes and big ears, and um, they're just adorable. So I just thought it'd be a really fun thing to explore. So I kind of sold the book on the basis of the idea, and then I realized, uh-oh, I better figure out what's happening in this three-book plot. <laughs> So I think we will wrap up the questions here. Um, if you have more questions, you're welcome to ask oh, Catherine absolutely. during the food and mingling time. But I think that's a good time okay, to transition into the exercise. All right, prepare yourselves, ladies and men. Um, OK, I want to reiterate, I don't like doing this kind of stuff myself, so you don't have to do it. You have carte blanche to ignore me. Um, grab a piece of paper and a pencil if you want. And you can do this individually, just you know, one on one, or you can get the whole table to do it, or you can do it with a friend, whatever works for you, OK? Also, you do not have to share it afterwards. That's an important rule. So um, here's what we're going to do. You get plenty of pr practice writing at school. And you can write at home. So I'm not going to talk to you as much about how to write as I am going to talk to you about that annoying inner editor in your head. So here's what we're going to do. You may have noticed I've written a lot of books from the point of view of weird things like aliens and gorillas and trees. So we're going to play with that a little bit. First thing I want you to do, I want you to choose a feeling. Don't overthink it. Just pick something that's interesting to you. Maybe you're gonna, this is going to apply to a character. So maybe your character is surprised about something, or bored, or envious, shocked about something. Maybe your character is grieving. Maybe your character is horrified by something. Um, amused, odd, thinks something's hilarious. Just pick a feeling. Any feeling you want. The feeling could be not having any feelings, just kind of like hanging out and feeling bored. That's a feeling in my book. OK, so everybody got a feeling? OK, doesn't matter, trust me. You can, oh, by the way, because um, this is supposed to be fun, you can um, cheat and change later. So <laughs> cheating is allowed. OK, now, I, this is the fun part, I think. 
I want you to choose a non-human character. And I mean non-human. You can pick a spoon, an armadillo, a cell phone, a dandelion, a piece of fuzz, an alien, uh, an amoeba, um, you know, uh, this building, uh, the table you're writing on. It doesn't matter. It can be uh, animate, inanimate, a rock, a squirrel. Um, I like animals because they're just, to me, they're easier and they're fun. And I'm, I, I wanted to be a vet when I was growing up. I worked for a vet, so I think that's why I keep writing about animals. Um, uh, hmm? Oh, absolutely, that's a great idea. I meant to say that, good thinking. Yeah, you can make up something. Just create something like I did with Enling. Um, Bix the Dairn is a hybrid of a dog and a kangaroo and a human. Um, so yeah, you could create a hybrid animal. That's, that's a really fun idea. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna give you just a couple minutes on this because I know it's a little bit more important. So, Think for a minute, and then we'll do, we'll do the last part. And again, cheating is allowed. You can change your mind. You can copy off your, your neighbor. <laughs> Isn't this fun? It's not like school. <laughs> OK, so here's what you're going to do. And we'll, what do you think, about 10 minutes? OK. Um, you're writing a diary. And you are going to write an entry in your diary, and it's from the point of view of this character, this piece of fuzz, or this imaginary animal, or this spoon that you've decided is your character, and now you're wondering why you chose that. And that character is feeling an emotion, and that emotion is the first thing you picked. So maybe you have now stuck yourself with a bitter spoon, or um, a surprised amoeba, and you're thinking, what was I doing? Welcome to being a writer. But you're total, it's totally OK if you want to change it, because the point is not really about writing from the point of view. Point of view, you guys have probably had some practice with at school. Um, you know, that's, there are different ways of looking at a story. I can tell it myself, or someone else can tell it. Um, and there are lots of gradations of point of view. That's, you'll learn all that. You'll figure all that out. What I want you to do while you're writing this is observe your inner editor. That is actually the task here. As you're writing, what is she or he or it telling you? Does she need to shut up? So are you thinking, I can't do this, or this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of, or I really wish I'd just stayed home and watched TV, or I hate my mom because she made me come here, or um, this is the most fun I've ever had in my life and I can't wait to write an entire novel. Uh, what is your inner editor telling you as you write? So basically, you have to splice your brain in half because you're going to be writing for 10 minutes, but in the back of your mind, I want you to watch what you're telling yourself because that's what we're really interested in. And then if you want to share what you've written or what your inner editor told you afterwards, you can. Okay, so about 10 minutes. Oh. 